Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 283. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co-founder of Lend at Fintech. Today's episode is sponsored by Lended Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. Lender's flagship event is happening online this year on April 27 to 29, with the possibility of an exclusive VIP in-person component. The verdict is in on Lender's 2020 event that was held online, with many people saying it was the best virtual event they had ever attended. Lender is setting the bar even higher in 2021. So join the fintech community at Lended Fintech USA, where you will meet the people who matter, learn from the experts, and get business done. Sign up today at lender.com slash USA. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Mary Catherine Lynch. She is the CFO of Renew Financial. Now, Renew Financial is is a super interesting company. They specialize in something called PACE Financing. That's P-A-C-E. If you don't know what that is, then today is your lucky day. We're going to delve into this in some depth. You'll have a very good understanding of it by the end of this episode. But, but, but basically, it is a type of home improvement financing. It's really focused on, on green energy and uh, things that help the environment. And there is various different types of use cases, which Mary Catherine gets into. Uh, and it's done on a state-by-state basis, which uh, she talks about as well. And uh, we also talk about women in fintech and uh, we, what Mary Catherine provides her perspective as a, as a leader that's been, uh, used to be an executive in, in finance for many years and what women can do to really help themselves and help each other uh, become a, a force in fintech. It was a fascinating interview. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Mary Catherine. Thanks. Great to be here. Okay, so um, I'd like to get these things started by giving the listeners uh, a bit of background. You've had a very interesting career when I was looking at your your LinkedIn profile. So why don't you give the listeners some of the highlights? Well, thank you. Going to relatively recent history, I guess, I was uh, an investment banker for 15 years. Um, I got got out of business school and I worked in New York uh, and then we moved to San Francisco and I, I stayed in investment banking. I went to business school because I wanted to be an investment banker. I really liked finance. So I worked for uh, different banks and I was in investment banking until 2008. I got laid off during the financial crisis. Right. Um, and at that time, I, I took uh, a little time to kind of figure out what I wanted to do next. I had three young kids at that point, so spent some time with them. But I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to do. And I loved and continue to love finance, but I wanted to, I decided that I really wanted to focus more on uh, renewables and energy efficiency. So Mm -hmm. combining finance with, with some other things that were important to me. Um, So with that, I started doing work in, in that industry. I uh, actually got a job as a contractor at Renew Financial and worked Hmm. there for a couple of years. I left because I was only working part-time at that point. I really liked the company, um, but they didn't have the resources to take on a full-time employee. So I went over, I spent uh, a few years working at Sunrun. And then when I was ready to leave Sunrun, Renew Financial's fortunes had had changed. Um, They were expanding, pace was growing rapidly. And as I, I had always liked the company and the people, so um, so I had the opportunity to come back, and uh, I've now been there for for five years. Right, right, great. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about Renew Financial and and what it does exactly? Renew Financial. So we're we're based in Oakland, California. I, I mentioned that because I also live in Oakland, and I'm a big fan of the city. So a little shout out for Oakland. <laughs> we were founded in 2008. And we started originating PACE in earnest, I would say, in in 2014. And I'll come back to PACE in a second. I'm throwing out an acronym. But we we finance renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. uh, And we focus on the residential market. So Mm -hmm. that that in a nutshell is what we do. We finance renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. 
Right, and why don't we why don't we dig into PACE for a little bit? Firstly, you can explain the acronym and and then explain what it is. You know, I, I must admit I I've never delved deeply into it, and I knew it was about uh, you know home improvement and that sort of thing. But why don't you give the listeners a, a sort of a crash course in PACE financing? Sure. So so PACE is an acronym. It's property assessed clean energy, and property assessed is very important and and very descriptive. So the PACE financing goes on your property taxes. It is a property tax. So if you are a homeowner and you use PACE to finance solar panels or putting in a new HVAC system, you can, you repay it when you pay your property taxes. Interesting. So then, and is this, well, what sort of, like, is, is this a state by state thing? Is this, is there a federal kind of regulation around this or where's it sort of come out? How, how has it sort of originated? Yeah, it, it is a state by state thing. There's not federal legislation. Mm-hmm. Right now, about 30 states have some type of PACE legislation. A lot of it is, covers commercial which Renew does does not do. We just focus on residential. The two big residential PACE markets are California and Florida. Right. And and that's where we operate. And and within those states, the different cities and counties, they have to opt into PACE. So they have to, you know, they meet um, and decide, yes, this is something we'd like to offer to the people who live here. And we set up the program. Right. Okay. And so when you're applying for a PACE loan then, and this is, this is going on your property taxes, how, how is the process different than if you were just going to apply for, you know, any other, any lender that provides, you know, you know renewables financing? Sure. So it's a property tax assessment. So it's on your property taxes. So it's a, it's very senior. A pretty unique thing about PACE is that we do not underwrite based on FICO. Mm -hmm. So we underwrite based on uh, the equity that people have in their houses and their ability to pay. And if you qualify for PACE, you get the rate. And the rates are typically based on the term of the financing as opposed to what your FICO score is. And, and I mention this because I think it's, it's unique and it's pretty important. When you look at securitizations of solar lenders, for example, mm-hmm. their average FICOs are 740, 750, that, that type of score. So our average FICO is kind of in the 670, 680 range, but our coupons are super attractive. Our, our weighted average coupon is about six and a quarter. So for people who have, you know, who are a little lower down on the credit scale, PACE can offer really attractive financing. And I think that's really important. You know, when we look at things like credit access, the ability to put an improvement on your house, we also do safety measures, which I'll come back to in a second. It's, it's very attractive. Right. So then how are you actually underwriting them? And if, if you're not using, I mean, is it, is it just purely underwritten on the property itself? Because I imagine there's, you know, there, there's a, a wide variety of, uh, of credit profiles of people who are doing this, but uh, what is it that you're using exactly? Yeah. So we look at the, we look at the, the value of the property mm-hmm. and we look at the debt that is attached to that. So we look at the mortgage or if they have a second mortgage and they need to have sufficient equity to support the the PACE loan. We also look at how much the payment would be and what percentage that would be of their property taxes. It can't be too high. And then we also look at at people's ability to pay. In California, we do a, a residual income test. So we look at their, you know, what their income is, we may look at pay stubs or bank statements, and we look at what their expenses are, and we want to make sure that they have the the wherewithal to to pay the assessment back. Right. Okay. So you are you are doing underwriting of, uh, based on the consumer's finances, just not on FICO. Correct. Right. Right. Got it. So then, as far as the the typical borrower, I mean, can you maybe describe 
you know, you've talked about the, what their average FICO is, but maybe, I mean, who is the who is a typical borrower that that um, comes to Renew Financial? I mean, we've done we've done thousands of projects, so there is a a broad there's you know it's a pretty broad base, mm-hmm. um, but you know beyond beyond the FICO that I mentioned, you know these are well they're all homeowners, they live in in California or Florida. They're typically, you know, two two income families, and uh, you know, looking to make some type of improvement on their home. One of our big measures in Florida is uh, is wind resistance. So Florida obviously has hurricanes, and so if you want to install, you know, a stronger roof, hurricane resistant windows or doors, you can use Pace to do that. Interesting, interesting. So, and and then obviously solar panels, um, new furnaces. You said is that are there other things that you can use a pace loan for? In California, so there's there's some state, you know, just because of of virtue of, of what is going on in the state. So in California, for example, you can use pace to make um, seismic retrofits, and you can also use it for for fire hardening. On the renewable energy side, solar panels. I mentioned batteries, you know, making your home more, um, improving the insulation of your home. Florida has, oh, there's also uh, water conservation measures in California. And Florida has uh, also does a lot of solar, but as I mentioned, uh, wind resistance is is probably the biggest measure in Florida right now. Right, right. So then I'm curious about why are you only in two states? I mean, there's there's obviously you said there's 30 states that have some kind of legislation, but why why just pick? Obviously, they're two of the larger states, but is there a reason you haven't kind of rolled out to more states? We are wor- working on rolling out to more states. We are looking at New York, Ohio, uh, Michigan, Texas, okay. and in Michigan, for example, they're looking at pace and considering adding projects that would help with uh, clean drinking water. Mm-hmm. So there's, we're, we're looking to, to expand our footprint into more states. Right, right. I and mean, I was reading something about uh, consumer protections. There are some unique consumer protections that come with a PACE loan. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I mean, consumer protections are sort of, I would say, throughout the product life cycle. So, I mean, we, we start out with the contractors, we screen the contractors that we work with. They have to be licensed in the state. They have to have insurance. They have to have a minimum rating from the Better Business Bureau. And we check their online reviews. Um, we also check their credit rating. And they have, to be, they have to be trained to sell PACE. One of the a pretty unique thing about PACE is that we require a signed certificate of completion. So we will not pay the contractor and there won't be an assessment placed on your property until the homeowner has signed a certificate that says, yes, this project was completed to my satisfaction. And obviously the contractor has to, has to sign it as well. When we, uh, as part of our underwriting process, Renew calls uh, every homeowner that is thinking about PACE and walks them through how the program works, what the coupon is, what their payment is going to be, what the term is. It's very similar to the disclosure that you get when you're putting a mortgage on your house. So, and obviously we record all those calls to make sure that the consumers understand that there's an assessment being placed on their property. And also we, we inspect projects. We do random expect inspections to make sure that the, the project was actually installed and that the consumers are protected. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So, and how, how are consumers finding out about this? Because it's, you know, I haven't, you don't like, I don't see ads on TV for Pace, maybe, or maybe there are, I don't see them, but how, how are you getting the word out and how are you educating people? Because it, it is different, obviously, than a traditional, you know, even an unsecured or secured loan. Yeah. Well, we have a website, of course, so people can go to our <laughs> website and, and learn about Pace, but our Salesforce works with contractors. Uh, we, at this point, obviously we're, an, we're an inside Salesforce, but we have a, a base of contractors in, in California and Florida. 
And when a homeowner calls a contractor, they, you know, suss out what the project's going to be. And then either the homeowner or the contractor will, will talk about how they're going to pay for the project. And if they need financing and it's a contractor that we work with, then the contractor may suggest pace. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So then what about other, other loan products? Do you, do you offer loans beyond the PACE program? We do not. Um, okay. We've looked at expanding our product offering, uh, doing unsecured or doing commercial PACE. But at this point, we are just focusing on residential PACE. Right. Okay. And then, and so I'm curious about like, how are you bringing um, technology to bear then on uh, on this, I mean, obviously you've got, you've probably got the underwriting process, but I'm curious about how, what, what sort of technology is involved from the sort of the application process through to the closing. Yeah. So <laughs> we, uh, I mentioned, for example, that we pull property values. So we're, you know, electronically reaching out via different vendors to pull the property values we have to pull credit reports to see what mortgage is on the property. So there's a lot of, you know, reaching out to third-party data providers. We have to make sure people aren't delinquent on their property taxes or they're, or they're not eligible for PACE. And, you know, we, this is all, all done online. People can, when we are doing our ability to pay underwriting, people um, are either uploading bank statements or we use um, third-party sources to check, you know, to check what their income is. But uh, coincidentally, we are actually in the process of, of putting in a new loan origination system and, and upgrading our platform. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then when, when the money is, the, the, does the money go directly to the contractor? It, it sounds like the homeowner doesn't actually, they don't, they don't take possession of this money at all, right? It just goes straight to the contractor? Yep. Okay. And then what, what's the, what's a typical, what's an average loan size that you're doing? Our lo- average loan size is about $25,000. Right. Right. Okay. And yeah, then, so a, a, the average payment annually is sort of $2,500. Okay. And then, that, and then the homeowner will just see that added on to their, their property tax bill when they, when they receive that each year. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So how are you funding these loans? Where's the, where's the capital coming from? Uh, so we have warehouse lines with banks. Mm-hmm. Um, we accumulate them in the warehouse. And then when we have critical mass, we either securitize or we might do a, a whole loan sale. Okay. Okay. And, and um, I was talking to someone earlier this week who was talking about PACE loans and saying that they're they have had tremendous you know, success as far as you know, repayment rates. Can you share some of the, you know, any kind of stats on, on the performance of these loans? Sure. So I, I like your source who said that we've had tremendous success. <laughs> you know, PACE is an attractive asset for investors. And obviously that helps us as originators and helps the, the end consumer as well. We our, ourselves and our competitors, uh, when we securitize the the top mo- most tranche of the bonds, is is rated AAA, mm. and our advance rates uh, from investors are very attractive on that. They like pace, and by they I mean investors. Their property tax assessments they are very very secure. the The underlying value of the property is is supporting those payments. Right, because because if they don't make those payments, they could lose their house, right? Not just the not just the um, solar panels or the furnace or whatever. Because if you don't if you don't pay your property taxes, there is that there is that risk, right? There is that risk. We yeah. we I will add have never foreclosed on on anyone. Interesting. Okay. So then, what about the what about the pandemic? I'd love I'd love to hear on two sides of, of you know the last you know. 10, nine, 10 months or what, what have you, uh, you know, I'd love to know about demand and then, you know, if there had, you know, what, what you've done for what programs you put in place for borrowers to see mm-hmm. if, um, you know, to give them some relief. Sure. So in terms of demand, uh, when the pandemic hit, we were, I guess, like many people, we were, we were really afraid and we right. didn't know what was going to happen. 
So we did see our volume fall off, but it really wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be and it, we were kind of bracing for. So, so that was great to see. And as I kind of think back to it, I mean, contractors are small businessmen and they are, or, or women, they are really resilient and they want to keep, you know, they need to keep the wheels running. So I think people sort of learn to, to try to sell around it, to do remote selling. A lot of projects are outside the house. You know, if they're doing solar, they're, they're up on the roof. They don't need to be inside the transaction. A lot of it can be done online. So we were, I would say, pleasantly surprised with, with how the year went. Our volume was down, but not by as, as much as we, as we thought it might be. And as we look ahead, 2021 looks, uh, it's off to a good start. And, and we are definitely projecting that it's, you know, it's going to be an improvement over 2020. Right. And as far as like the borrowers themselves, could, uh, if it's, this is part of the property tax, how much flexibility do you have in providing forbearance and that sort of thing? Oh, right. You, you mentioned that. And I, um, so we, we do have a hardship program. If, if borrowers are, if they can't make a payment, if they've lost their job or they've, you know, they're having health issues, they can contact us and we will, we will work with them so that they don't, they don't run into, you know, some type of, you know, foreclosure issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So then can you, can you give us some sense uh, of the scale you guys have at, um, what kind of, what kind of volume that um, you've originated so far? Sure. So we've, uh, to date, we've originated about 1.2 billion of, uh, of resi pace. Mm -hmm. um, and the industry as a whole has securitized, uh, I think we're up to about 6 billion of residential pace. Right, right. So still, okay, you still, there's, there's, there's a lot of um, room left. I mean, that's a decent, it's a decent amount. Don't get me wrong. I feel like that's a, that's a decent amount, but there's certainly, I mean, if you look at solar financing, I imagine it's uh, just that alone would probably dwarf that, right? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't have the numbers, but I imagine that the, the solar panels are, are, are getting more and more popular. Um, mm -hmm. is, like, like, is that, what is your real competition here? Do you feel like you are competing against the, the traditional financial institutions? Is it really more awareness? I mean, how are you, how do you find, like, what's your position in the market, do you think? I, I think it depends. And, and part of it, frankly, depends on the contractor. Like different contractors have different customers that they, that they sell to or different products that they offer. Sometimes we are competing against the solar loan guys, um, again, with the who typically have higher FICO customers. We also have higher FICO customers, but we will go down lower. Okay, so I want to switch gears completely here and talk about, uh, talk about something else and talking about um, really the gender gap and, uh, and, and women in fintech. It's, it's something that is, you know, you've been in finance, finance your whole career and there's you know, when I look at uh, the, the, you know, the, fin the fintech is very much a, a male dominated uh, industry. You're a, you're a, you know, you're a CFO and you've been a leader for some time. So maybe you could, what, what advice do you have for, for young women who are entering fintech today? What one welcome. <laughs> 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 I, guess, I guess a couple of things. So one, this isn't unique to women. I tell this to to people all the time, ask for what you want. I frequently talk to people who, you know, say, I really want X, but they don't want to do that. So I'm going to ask for Y. And, you know, I'm like, you know, ask for what you want. Let, let them do their job and try to negotiate you down. So I think that's true for anyone, but probably particularly for women, ask, ask for what you want. Mm -hmm. Women have to help other women. It's, it's, it's just part of our job. We have to do that. Right. Um, and women have to ha ask for help. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of our job too. So that's my advice. Right. And how do you think it's changed since, um, if you, you, when you came into finance, I mean, it was, 
you know, there's, there's still this mentality of like an old boys club and everyone. Going, you can say it. It was a long time ago. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, it's, a, it's a, but there's been an old boys club, you know, playing golf, drinking together, what have you. How do you feel like it's changed? Particularly, I'm curious about, you know, the last few years where we've had the Me Too movement and other things. Mm-hmm. What, what, what do you think has changed for women in finance today? Yeah, that's, uh, I really like that ab- observation because I think it has changed. It's not, you know, we're not done, but, but it has changed and it's gotten better. I think w- when I started, one, I don't think women were that supportive of other women. That's not true of everyone, certainly, but there, there seemed to be some competition. And I think the view was like, okay, women, like, you know, suck it up. Like, mm-hmm. this is the way it is. And, you know, you need to, you need to fit in. And I think women today are, <laughs> they're, they, you know, that, that's not how it is. Women today, I think, are, are much better at saying, wait a minute, that, that's not how it's supposed to work. You know, we're 50% of the population here. So I'm, I'm heartened by that. I'm heartened by women just, you know, calling when something's not right, speaking up very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's a fantastic development. Right, right. So then what about, I mean, at, at, at your company, I mean, and, and a lot also maybe fintech and more broadly, I mean, what, are you, what can we do to, to really bridge the gender gap? And that the, the gap really in two, there's a two-part, two parts to that is what I mean. One is a gender gap in the number of women. Then, of course, mm-hmm. there's, the, there's the gender pay gap that, uh, that still exists today. Yeah, I mean, I think I think people, depending on on where they sit in the industry, have have different roles to play. So, for me, for example, I I can have a big impact on hiring, and I have to be deliberate and insistent on on hiring women. You know, working with HR to make sure that we get good candidates in, and that we're not we're not being biased. Those I I, I can influence that just given where I sit. Mm-hmm. I think another thing that's really important is, is talking to women and asking them what they need. You know, obviously there is a big issue when women start to have children. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, you know, we, we deal with this. We've been dealing with this uh, recently frequently at Renew, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, ask the, what you need. We, you know, we absolutely want you to come back. What do you need? How long do you need? You know, do you need flexibility? Like retaining those, those people is super important to the company. Um, so I, I just think you have to be very explicit in talking to them and they need to be clear about, about what they need. Mm-hmm. And then I would say, finally, just quantifiable goals are, are important. You know, you, you and your organization organize conferences. I mean, you know, half the panelists have to be women. Set, set a goal um, right. and try to, you know, try, yep. no, try to hit that metric. We do. And we, we, are, we, we are getting better every year. Uh, we're not quite at 50% yet, but we are we are getting a lot better and it is it's something that we that i you know we feel pretty strongly about we feel like we have a role to play if we if we want to have more gender equality then we need to be highlighting you know women leaders and bringing them on stage and, and letting them have a voice so we are we are certainly fully aware of that we have we have a whole women in fintech range of different programs that that that, uh, that is run by actually our our president, Joy Schwartz, who um, is really very passionate about uh, about this topic as well. So anyway, we're, we're almost out of time, but maybe just before I let you go, why don't you just give us some, um, you know, talk about next, what, what's next for a new financial, what is coming down the pipe? Yeah, well, as I, I mentioned previously, we are putting in a, a new loan origination system. So we are all very excited about that about that happening um, and, and the good things that we think it's going to bring both for the, the customer as well as just being much more efficient. We are looking at expanding into new states, which hopefully will happen in 2021. So that would be great to get a, a third leg of the stool for us. And, you know, and I guess finally, p- politically, we have, a, we have Democrats coming in who are talking about doing more to promote clean energy and energy efficiency. 
and I think that will, you know, that will give us a, give us a bit of a tailwind, which will be a, a great different environment for us to operate in. Do you, have, do you ever envision a, a possible, a, a potential like federal legislation here that for PACE financing? You know, Biden, when he was the VP, was a was a fan of PACE. So I don't know that I don't think, given where we are, that PACE is one of his absolute top priorities <laughs> it right now. It won't be in the first year. It won't be in the first year. <laughs> but we would we would love to see some type of uh, federal program so we could expand all fifty states. Right, right. Okay, well, we'll have to leave it there, Mary Catherine. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Best of luck, and uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much. Okay, see ya. I mean, I hope you have a good understanding now about PACE financing. I know I certainly know a lot more than I did 30 minutes ago. And you know, just to, one thing I wanted just to just to emphasize here, I mean, no defaults. That is, we get $1.2 billion of financing and no defaults. That is pretty impressive. And it sort of speaks, I think, to the, to the structure of, of the loan as well as, you know, no defaults to a sub 700 you know, FICO population. I don't know if there's many other types of lenders that could, uh, or any other lent types of lenders that could really say that that's been their reality. So really, I think pace financing is super interesting. I, I think it's going to grow. I actually think they're, there may well be a federal movement on this under a Biden administration. I think there's, you know, there's, there's certainly a push for more green energy type initiatives, and this, this, this makes uh, perfect sense to me. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Today's episode was sponsored by Lended Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. Lendit's flagship event is happening online this year on April 27 to 29, with the possibility of an exclusive VIP in-person component. The verdict is in on Lenders 2020 event that was held online, with many people saying it was the best virtual event they had ever attended. Lendit is setting the bar even higher in 2021. So join the fintech community at Lendit Fintech USA, where you will meet the people who matter, learn from the experts, and get business done. Sign up today at lendit.com/usa.